Chamber of Law, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. I'm Carolyn Shapiro, Associate Professor of Law and Director of the Institute of, on the Supreme Court of the United States at IIT Chicago Kent College of Law. I'm here with my colleague, Professor Sheldon Namod, to talk about the Affordable Care Act case uh, on the decision that came down just a few days ago. So, Shell, could you just quickly summarize what the bottom line holdings were, and then we'll go back and talk about them in more detail. First, the individual mandate was upheld. Secondly, for the most part, the Medicaid expansion was upheld as well. So the individual mandate is the part of the statute that requires uh, people who can afford it to have health coverage, or alternatively, if they don't choose to buy health insurance, they have to pay uh, a penalty. And everybody, the big fight about this had to do with whether Congress had the power to, to impose that kind of requirement under the Commerce Clause. Right. Um, can you just quickly explain why do we even talk about whether Congress has the power to do something? We talk about that because this government is one of enumerated powers and Congress has to act pursuant to a, a particular enumerated power. It could be the Commerce Clause, it could be taxing, it could be spending. And most of the attention was focused, in fact, on the Commerce Power because that's the natural fit for something that regulates an economic activity. And, but in fact, as it turns out, the Supreme Court, or five of the justices on the right. Supreme Court, found that the Affordable Care Act mandate does not, is not supported by the commerce power. Well, that's right. Justice Roberts and four of the dissenters, the so-called conservatives, uh, all agreed that the commerce power didn't work here. But five justices, Justice Roberts and four other justices, the so-called liberals, really moderates, agreed that the taxing power did sustain the constitutionality of the individual mandate. What is the taxing power? Uh, the taxing power, which we all know, especially around April 15th, really year-round, is that Congress has power uh, to tax individuals. And so that's, and that's the basis on which the Chief Justice, uh, who was the only one uh, of the conservatives to find that the, the mandate was constitutional, that's the basis on which he rested his Correct. conclusion. Correct. So do, do we know what that means going forward for the scope of Congress's commerce power? Well, it's very interesting because technically speaking, uh, Chief Justice Roberts did not have to say anything about the commerce power since the court had sustained the constitutionality of the individual mandate on the basis of the taxing power. So technically, as lawyers would say, it's dictum. What that means is it's not uh, really the law, quote unquote, but when five justices of the Supreme Court agree that this could not be sustained under the commerce power, it has a, a lot of force. It's pretty much a shot uh, across the bow. Congress now knows what, it, what its limits are, and the American people now have a good sense of what the limits of the commerce power are, so long as these five justices are around, at least. And the limit is, uh, the, the line that they drew was inactivity. Correct. That Congress can't uh, regulate inactivity, can't force people into the marketplace. Correct. And that all five of them basically agreed to that, Correct. To that rationale. Correct. A rather formal approach, because pretty clearly the failure to buy uh, health care insurance has an economic effect. But nevertheless, they drew the line between activity, commercial activity, and commercial inactivity. And the four uh, more moderate justices, uh, led by Justice Ginsburg, uh, would have upheld the mandate Correct. under the Commerce Clause. Yes. So uh, was this a surprise, this outcome? Uh, some of us predicted this outcome, but I don't know of anybody who predicted the outcome based on the taxing power. I know I did not. I thought it would be five to four. Uh, didn't know who the fifth so-called conservative justice would be. Five to four to uphold the mandate. Five to four to uphold the mandate, that's, that's correct. Uh, the taxing power surprised me. The government, fortunately, for those who think that the individual mandate is wise and constitutional, the government made the argument it got little or no play, as we all know, in the mass media. 
Uh, um, and when you say you predicted the outcome, are you surprised that it's Chief Justice Roberts who turns out to have been the swing vote? Well, I, I had thought that it could possibly be Justice Scalia because he had joined the majority opinion in the medical marijuana case, the race case, some years ago. I never did think it would be Justice Kennedy because on federalism issues, you know, the F word that we really haven't talked about yet, on federalism issues, he's moved very much to the conservative side. And maybe you could say a word or two about what federalism is and why this case implicates federalism at all. The case implicates federalism because when Congress acts constitutionally, it effectively disables the states very often from acting in the same area. And even if it doesn't disable the states from acting in the same area, it surely disables the states from acting in any manner inconsistent with what Congress has done. Uh, and therefore, these kinds of issues, commerce power, taxing power, spending power, other powers, implicate federalism. That is the role of the states. May I say something about uh, a little understood aspect of federalism? Absolutely. Why the, many of the justices think, uh, feel so strongly about it. Um, even though individual rights are often protected by the Bill of Rights uh, and uh, equal protection and due process, uh, nevertheless, the framers thought that the states uh, had to serve as a buffer, if you will, against the tyranny of the national government to protect individuals from the national government. So it's a kind of structural argument, to use a fancy word, which in the view of many people uh, protects, federalism protects individual rights and not just states' rights. It protects individual rights by having this other level of sovereignty or other level of government that is accountable to the people Correct. through a completely different mechanism. Correct. And also political accountability, you're right, is one factor. And also uh, allows the states, if you will, to step in between the individuals and the federal government. So let's talk about the other aspect of the opinion, sure. which uh, the other aspect of the case, which does also directly implicate federalism. This had to do with the Medicaid expansion, uh, which requires states uh, to, to provide Medicaid, which is uh, health insurance for the poor, to uh, people up to 133 percent of the poverty line uh, who are under 65. This is a pretty major expansion. Major indeed. Uh, it, it covers single people who haven't previously been covered by Medicaid. Um, and the, the Supreme Court upheld this requirement, but, but sort of limited it's the federal government's ability to, to impose conditions on the state. Maybe you could talk a little bit about sure. that. Sure. It's been long understood that the uh, spending power is an independent power of Congress, which can be exercised for the general welfare. It's pretty broad. It's not connected to any of the enumerated powers that we were talking about earlier. So the question is, when does Congress exceed its power under the spending power and thereby uh, implicate federalism in an adverse way. Well, the Supreme Court held in this case that because the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act punished, if you will, uh, the states who did not agree to the expansion of Medicaid, the significant expansion that you talked about, uh, if you will, sanction them, punish them by removing all Medicaid funding. Threatening all, to remove. Threatening to remove all Medicaid funding altogether. Uh, and that uh, f seven justices, interestingly enough, not just not only Justice Roberts and the four conservative justices, but Justice Breyer and Justice Kagan agreed with that, that this was, to paraphrase, if I remember what Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts said, it's like a gun held to the head of the states. And that was too much under the spending power. So the risk of losing all of their Medicaid funding, which is a significant portion of state budgets uh, was too coercive. Yes, I think if I remember the figure correctly, on an average uh, was 10% of it's the typical to, state's funding. I think it could be even closer to yeah, 20%. Well, significant. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty major portion of state budget. And of course, Medicaid is a f cooperative federal state okay. program. Some of the money comes from the federal government. Some of the money comes from the states. And the states, generally speaking, have to, if they want the federal money, have to run the program according to the, the, the federal government's uh, criteria, right? That basic structure isn't changed. Correct. Right. What's changed is the imposition of uh, the requirement that states expand their Medicaid program 
at the risk, or if not, risk losing all of their Medicaid. Payments. And what's also interesting about that, uh, even though just Chief Justice Roberts referred to this as a gun to the head, uh, I think until 2016, for states that opt in, the federal government was paying 100 percent. And thereafter, it was 90 percent of the expansion. But yet, the Supreme Court, uh, seven justices thought this went too far. So a state could opt in to this, uh, to, to this expansion and not actually have to spend any more money um, of its own from its for own For the budget. foreseeable future for the short term. At least for the, in the short term. Right. Um, but, but as Chief Justice Roberts pointed out, of course, Congress could change that formula at some point in yes, the future. Yes, it could. So this actually creates kind of an interesting political moment where some uh, Republican governors are actually threatening not to take what is essentially free money uh, from the federal government because they don't have to. Uh, that's exactly correct. But you know, that's probably appropriate because what the individual mandate and Medicaid expansion decisions basically said was that this is for the political process. The political process has spoken, and now let's leave it up to the individual states to decide whether to opt in or not. And that's, that's appropriate, it seems to me. Opt into the Medicaid expansion, yes. but the rest of the law, they don't. Stands. Have, the rest of the law stands. Correct. So an individual state, for example, could choose not to set up uh, these insurance exchanges through which people can purchase health insurance that they need to purchase under the mandate. And that's something they can opt out of, but if they don't do it, the federal government will do it for Correct. Them. That's under the statute itself. States that didn't choose, that don't choose to do their, uh, create these exchanges. So it's been a pretty fascinating uh, few days. As <laughs> to understate it considerably. Um, and, and one of the interesting things, as we talked about already, is that there isn't really a clear majority opinion at all. The Chief Justice's opinion is, uh, for the most part, for himself alone. And then the four more moderate justices, moderate liberal justices, write, uh, all join one opinion. Um, so do you anticipate in the future that there will be fights about what precisely the holding of this case is? Well, as I mentioned earlier, technically this is dictum. This, the individual mandate Commerce Clause discussion did not have to be addressed, but it's it's powerful. Well, I'd like to say a word, if I may, about Chief Justice Roberts, who's yes. been getting uh, excoriated in some circles uh, because of his opinion on the individual mandate in particular. There probably is an element of statesmanship there, statesmanship there, but I also think that he honestly believed that the statute, the individual mandate, was sustainable uh, as a tax. Uh, I'm not going to suggest that it was all political in that respect at all. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt on this thing. Uh, so I think uh, he reached a sound decision. Now, my own view was that this was an easy case under the Commerce Clause but for, five upholding the for upholding the mandate, but five justices disagreed with me. So who am I to disagree with five justices of the Supreme Court? Uh, so uh, the uh, Chief Justice Roberts might have been considering statesmanship, what, why, what, what's the argument there that statesmanship plays a role? Well, the argument there goes back, if you will, to Bush v. Gore, where the Supreme Court, as we all remember, in a bitterly contested decision, effectively, uh, according to some at least, elected George Bush president of the United Certainly States. Certainly stopped the vote counting in Florida. That's, that's correct. Uh, five to four decision, as we know. And then things weren't helped, and that, that's political partisan. Uh, that's a political uh, partisan attack. Uh, in, on the court. Uh, on the court. And then you had the Citizens United case a few years ago, which got a lot of people upset in terms of uh, saying that there was no constitutional limit, no free speech limits on the corporate expenditures uh, in connection with uh, campaigns and the like. And now you had this one. I think Justice, Chief Justice Roberts was sensitive to all of that. Again, I don't think that was the driving consideration for him. Was it a factor in his decision? Probably. The, the, the concern would be that people see the court as a purely political actor. That's correct. And if, people, and if justices vote in ways that are not necessarily consistent with what we did predict politically, then that suggests that there's something else going That's on. That's right. It was interesting when I read this very lengthy opinion of his, which is, I think, 59 pages. Yes. Uh, he said at the outset that the wisdom of legislation is not for the Supreme Court. The constitutionality of legislation is only for the Supreme Court. And I wish that the media had remembered a little bit more of that uh, in the months leading up to this decision.
it's really not, the court is not speaking on whether or not it thinks the Affordable Care Act is a good idea or not. Uh, that, and the, the, there's sort of a, a, a sense that Chief Justice Roberts might not think it's such a good idea. Correct. But nonetheless thinks it's constitutional. Which is a good example, if that's the case, and I suspect it is, of judicial restraint. Upholding something that you think is not Is wrong, good is, is not wise. Shell, thank you so much for My talking pleasure. with me about it. Um, I look forward to talking to you again. I'm sure we will.